This is the Elegoo Neptune 4 Pro, Elegoo's first go at a Clipper firmware powered 3D printer. This thing has a lot going for it. It's continuing what Elegoo has been doing lately of FDM printers that pack a lot of features into pretty affordable packages. But this is not in any way a review of this machine. This video is for people in the future, because currently only reviewers have these machines and there's one glaring thing that I keep seeing people mention about it already, and that's the lack of Wi-Fi on it. So I'm gonna teach you how to add it. And for the rest of you not in the future, I'll give you a quick rundown of the specs. For those of you who are in the future, how is it? Has AI taken over yet? Anyway, there's timestamps in the description so you can jump to the Wi-Fi section if you want. For the rest of us here in present day, just worried about the AI apocalypse, let's do an overview of this machine. I don't have nearly enough time on it yet to do a review, and I may not review it at all. We'll talk about that later. It feels like only yesterday Elegoo launched the Neptune 3 Pro and we already have the 4 Pro. If you were to put them side by side, they would look really similar, but I promise you there are quite a few differences under the hood. A lot of what I find interesting about this machine is what it's packing in at the price, so I might as well get that out of the way. This machine right here in the US is $299 flat with free shipping on Elegoo's website. Let's start off with the bed because it's more than meets the eye. It's 235 by 235 on X and Y. It has a spring steel PEI coated bed sheet on it, but underneath of it is a segmented PCB bed heater, meaning that this has separate heating zones. So if you don't need the entire bed heated, it won't heat the entire bed. This is a feature I've only ever seen in higher end machines, so it's really unique at a machine at this price point. I haven't looked deep into how they're controlling or operating it yet. I don't see a slicer setting, so I'm assuming it's on the firmware side, but I don't have a thermal imaging camera to really test this out any deeper, unfortunately. Sticking out like a sore thumb behind the direct drive tool head is this big box on the back of this gantry. That is auxiliary cooling to add a curtain of air across the bed to improve cooling when printing faster. Simple but effective, four 4020 blower fans are ducted to blow forward just underneath the nozzle not down onto the bed to provide additional part cooling. The way it's wired is pretty basic. It's tied into the same circuit as your tool head part cooling fans. So when those are turned on or whatever they're set to, so is the auxiliary cooling system. You can bypass it and turn it off, but it's a manual switch on top of the unit. Kind of basic, but at this price point, I get it. I can also get turning it off because it's not the quietest thing. Through the menu system, you can adjust its noise level during a print for mute, normal, or violent mode, but that will limit how much airflow is coming out of it depending on what you choose. Now, what about that tool head setup? Fast printing needs flow, and the Neptune 3 Pro has a fairly anemic hot end design in it. I said in my Neptune 3 Max review that it really needed something better. This is way different despite looking very much the same on the outside. It's got a similar dual gear drive extruder system, but it's now using a NEMA 14 stepper motor and some minor tweaks to get the weight down. The entire tool head weighs 24% less, about 90 grams less than the Neptune 3 Pro tool head. That extruder is feeding filament into a higher flow hot end. This is a very similar design to the Ender 7 or Ender 5 S1 that have a not volcano, but in between a Mark 8 and volcano length of nozzle in it and does absolutely increase flow rate. I've only run one, one flow rate test with this cookie CAD unicorn PLA filament and I hit 20 millimeters cubed per second on that single racetrack test. Continuing our changes, the X and the Y gantries both use these metal roller wheels on here instead of V-slot roller wheels. I don't know if there's a standardized name for these at this point. I've seen them previously on like the X-Tool D1 laser that I have. They do feel really smooth and solid and Elugu claims these are helping them to achieve higher speeds on this machine. Next up, let's speed run through a few things that, silly to say it, are starting to feel like standard features on a machine like this. We've got a filament runout sensor, direct drive extruder assembly, auto bed leveling and manual adjustments so you can fine tune it, LED lights on the tool head and underneath the top bar or the machine to illuminate the work area, dual Z axis motors, easy belt adjustment on the X and Y axes, and a pretty solid touchscreen interface. But what's definitely different for Elegoo, if you turn it to the side, you'll find an RJ45 port to connect this wired to your local network. That passes through to connect to your main board, which in this case is a clone of a MakerBase skipper board that has a single board computer and your microcontroller on the same board. And that's the star of the show, which has the Clipper firmware installed out of the box here. But that's also the heart of our problem here. 
You see, the board is using one of the MakerBase MKS Pis effectively built into the board. That, like many Raspberry Pi clones, does not have Wi-Fi built into it. Meaning if you want to connect this machine to the network, you do have to use the wired network connection or an external USB Wi-Fi dongle, but that's not as easy as just putting one in and going. We'll get to that explanation of how to set it up in a second, but quickly, I want to defend this machine. I've seen plenty of grumbles about the lack of Wi-Fi making this machine a bit of a non-starter, and I understand where that's coming from. In a traditional traditional clipper install, something like my Voron 0.1, that is run headless. It has no controls directly on the machine. I completely operate it over my network through a web browser on my computer. This machine can be operated that way if you wire connect it to your network. You can access the fluid web interface and run it that way. If you hook up the Wi-Fi that I'm going to show you how to do in a moment, you can do it through there as well but you don't have to do it with this machine. I mean zero offense with the next words that are about to come out of my mouth, but it's the best phrase that I've come up with to explain this machine. In my mind, in my eyes, this is baby's first clipper machine. By that I mean, if you have a Neptune 3 Pro and you pick up one of these four pros to go alongside of it, you will feel right at home. The touchscreen UI is almost identical and it operates the same way. You can run this machine like a Marlin printer, but get the speed benefits of clipper. So you can take the USB stick, put it in your computer, slice your G code, put it on there, put it here and print and not have to use the web interface. I will say that the menu system is not very deep. We can't adjust things like acceleration, rotation distance or input shaper values through that touchscreen. And usually I would knock a company for that. But the thing about it is this machine is only an included network cable away from accessing all of that and so much more. Fluid web interface is already installed on here with no additional hardware or software configuration connected to your network and you can access everything you could ever want on this machine. This would allow somebody who's not used to Clipper to just get going with it get printing and running the machine. And when they feel ready to, they can start looking into the advanced options or they don't ever have to, and they could just run it all air gapped from their network and never connect it if they don't want to. Unfortunately, when you do want to access those advanced functions, getting this thing onto your Wi-Fi network is not nearly as simple as I wish it was. It's not as simple as just throwing a dongle into the USB port. So let me show you what you got to do. Step one, you have to find a Wi-Fi dongle that actually works. I tried four and only one worked on this machine. You see, this is running Armbian Linux as the base operating system, and that distribution of Linux only comes with certain Wi-Fi drivers pre-installed. And unfortunately, finding one that's going to work for you, not as simple as it should be. There are lists that will tell you, oh, these ones work on Armbian Linux. But what happens very often in tech, and what happened to me twice, is the packaging will be the same, the part number will be the same, but they'll change the chip inside of the product and it will no longer work. To save you some trouble, the one I found that ended up working, I put an affiliate link in the description to this one. It's $5 with free shipping on AliExpress. I actually robbed it out of the Cheaty X Max and I got a put it back in that machine. With the Wi-Fi dongle that's going to work in hand, we got to plug it into the USB port on the front of the machine. And with the magic of video editing, I got it right on the first try. The rest of our configuration work will have to be done via terminal on a computer. So we are going to have to connect this via the wired connection at least once. Plug it in, get it onto my network, and now we can head to the computer. We need to use some type of program to SSH into our client, in this case, the Neptune 4 Pro. I'm on Windows, so I'm going to use PuTTY to do this. To SSH into this thing, we are going to need to know the IP address that is assigned to it by our network. When using the wired connection, Elgu has made this very simple. We go into the settings menu, hit about machine, and at the bottom, it'll tell us the IP address of it. Write that down, and that's what we'll need to use in our terminal. With our IP address in hand, we plug that into PuTTY and connect. That'll open a terminal, which will ask us for a login. We have two options here. The default one, which is MKS, or if you want root access for other things, you can use root. It'll then ask for the password. In this case, it is MakerBase. Thank you, Elegoo, for not changing the default login for the MKS Pi. First, we wanna make sure that the machine is seeing the Wi-Fi dongle. So we'll type LS USB. This will check all the USB devices plugged into the unit, and we should be able to see a Realtek controller in there. That is the Wi-Fi dongle that I'm using. 
Side note, just because your Wi-Fi dongle appears in that USB list does not mean it will work. The ones that I had that didn't work still appeared in this list. To get this configured, we need to use the network manager. Unfortunately, it doesn't come installed on this machine, so we're gonna have to install it. We're gonna type sudo space apt space install space network dash manager. Our board will install the network manager for itself and we are ready to move on. Now we're ready to access the network manager. To open it, we type in NMTUI and hit enter. Once it's open, the second item on the list will say activate connection. We want to select that. When it opens, if our Wi-Fi dongle is working properly, we should see our wired connection followed by a list of the network SSIDs available to it. Hopefully the first one on the list is your strongest connection. In my case, my studio Wi-Fi. I'll select that one. And then I can enter the password for my Wi-Fi to get it logged in. And now I can disconnect the wired connection and use this thing on Wi-Fi but I need to find the IP address of it so I can do that. You can often find whatever devices are connected to your Wi-Fi through your router's interface, and it'll give you a list of the devices that are connected to it at any given time, or you can use an application like Angry IP Scanner. As long as the computer you are using is connected to the same Wi-Fi and you don't have any weird security protocols set up, which let's face it, if you're running those type of security protocols, you probably don't need this guide at all. Then you should just be able to hit start and it'll search for all the devices within a IP address range and tell you what's what. This machine should show up as mkspy.localdomain. Note down whatever that IP address is and we can plug that into a web browser to access the web interface for this machine and operate Clipper through that. Or if you don't wanna do any of that, just plug the network cable in. It's going to be more reliable in the long run and it'll be easy to find the IP address right through the touchscreen. We are dealing with cheap USB Wi-Fi dongles here. I did have one time while filming this where it wasn't able to detect my Wi-Fi in the studio. All I did was unplug it from the machine, plug it back in and restart the machine and then I was able to get connected again. So the wired connection really is going to be more reliable. A quick note, I tried a cheap USB 3 hub I got off of Amazon. I was able to plug the Wi-Fi dongle, the stock USB stick that came with it and a Logitech C920 webcam into it. That's only getting about three FPS, but all three are working at the same time. But guide out of the way, let's talk about some final thoughts and the fact that I won't be reviewing this machine or possibly any machines moving forward. Quite simply, I've come to the realization that the way that I review machines is unsustainable at my scale. I don't have an LTT lab team behind me to produce the testing data and then analysis of it for me. Every step of the process is all me. Spool after spool of filament, hours of print time, hours of production on videos, means that when I put a review out, it's generally weeks or months after a product has released. And other reviews have already come out where somebody just printed a half dozen models and then moved on to the next machine. They are going to get the bulk of the views, which means they're gonna get the bulk of the money. My reviews simply do not pay me back for the amount of time, let alone filament, that I put into them, unfortunately. We are still gonna have a ton of fun with 3D printing on this channel moving forward. We're just gonna be making more things, building fun machines, and focusing less on the minutia and detail of things like how these machines work, which tickles my brain a little bit, but we're gonna have some fun building some fun projects moving forward. All right, folks, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, maybe you'll enjoy my Elegoo Neptune 3 Max review. Might be my last review for quite some time, so maybe check that out. Or this video that YouTube thinks is best for you. Get subscribed to keep up to date with everything that's coming down the line and to ensure your 3D prints don't fail. It's not a guarantee, but it can't hurt. See you, folks.